Ayana O'Mara, and Dr. O'Mara is cur the current NICU clinical pharmacy specialist at Wake Med in Raleigh, North Carolina. She has worked at UF Health, U uh, University of Florida Health Shands as the NICU clinical pharmacy specialist there as well from 2013 to 2020. She's also been the neonatal clinical pharmacist at Duke University Medical Center from 2011 to 2013 and the neonatal clinical pharmacy specialist at Bond Secures Health System from 2010 to 2011. She received her doctorate of pharmacy at UNC Chapel Hill. And as you can see from her extensive accomplishments, she is really well-versed in NICU pharmacy. And I'm just really excited to have her here. She does a lot of research and she's gonna provide us with the information that we need to know when we go to upgrade to a safer enteral feeding system in our hospitals. So without further ado, I'd like to really welcome Dr. O'Mara. Thank you for being here. Thank you. Okay, so we'll just go ahead and get right into the talk today so we can get to the questions portion for whatever questions you all may have. Today, we'll be discussing some of the important safety implications of enteral tubing, uh, particularly looking at potential infection risk of enteral tubing in general, and then cleaning procedures for the infant tubing products line. We'll discuss some pharmacy dosing considerations um, and looking at the accuracy of infant compared to some other designs. And then we will review some patient advocacy strategies as it's related to enteral device safety. So the reason that we're all talking about this today and the reason that changes to the enteral system have evolved over the last several years is that device misconnections can be absolutely devastating when they occur. Nearly 40% of device misconnections have been attributed to enteral tubing. And we do know that enteral feeds that are infused intravenously can result in significant morbidity and mortality. And so finding ways to change the risk for this is important in all patient populations. The International Organization for Standardization, or ISO, created small bore connection standards, specifically 80369 for enteral systems. GETSA members, which is the Global Enteral Device Suppliers Association, these members attempted to answer the call for new device designs with these new standards in mind. So for those of you who may not be as well versed in the standards, I wanted to just give a quick background of the different standards so that you'll understand as we're talking through the rest of the presentation um, where all of these pieces play in together. So ISO 20695 specifies the requirements for all enteral feeding devices, and this includes syringes, tubes, lines, any accessories. 20695 incorporates the small board connector requirements that are in 80369-1 and 80369-3. So 80369-1 are the general requirements for small bore connectors that are utilized to deliver liquids or gases in patient care settings. So this is really what's saying that different device types cannot connect to each other. The goal of this standard is to increase patient safety and reduce the risk of misconnections between any unrelated delivery systems, um, not just necessarily the enteral. 80369-3 is the standard that specifically applies to the enteral system and the specifications for what that must be um, to meet that specific standard. So for those that may not uh, be within the US, um, we have the male syringes and that's the most common type that we see here. In places outside of the US, the male slip tips oral syringe is not as frequently utilized. And the other type of syringe that you can have is a female syringe. So instead of having the male tip, it's a female tip. And we'll get a lot more into what that looks like in the rest of the presentation. But I just wanted to set the stage that everyone was on the same page later when we're talking about male syringes versus oral or versus female syringes. So some general background about the infit female syringe system. This is the syringe system that is endorsed by GEDSA as a solution for the standards put forth in 80369-3. For again, those of us in the US who are used to male oral syringes, this is a reverse orientation. And that's important when we're thinking about what a syringe looks like to us normally and how it normally performs. One of the big things that I want to highlight is that the 
integral design standards were really framed around integral formula and how to deliver integral feeds into the integral space, and less so with medication administration. But as we know, many patients who can't take food by mouth also can't take medications by mouth. And so it's important to consider the implications of medication administration when we're looking at any of these changes and potential designs. Of note, these syringes, um, the female syringes, are available to be used for both enteral and oral application, although the male oral syringe is technically only um, qualified to be used as an oral syringe. This change in the design led to some design concerns that we have with this new type of syringe that we haven't seen in other syringes. So the tip has a potential dosing risk. So if you look at the tip on the left in the syringe, that's the female infant syringe, and that can hold up to 0.2 mLs of drug or fluid. And so when we're thinking about our small patients, the entire dose may be 0.2 mLs or the entire dose may be less than that. So if we are worried that we are potentially under overdosing 0.2 mLs, this is a clinically significant volume to many of our smaller patients. There's also the tubes that these connect to. So the tubes are shown for you in the bottom box and at the bottom right section of that white box. This created some new areas for us to worry about being a male tube. And so we must think about, is there a potential dosing risk with these since we now have a new space that's been created? And is there potential for contamination risk since we have the male lumen sitting inside of a wider space? The reason again that we're all thinking so much about this now is that there is a proposed infant conversion for the US market that is supposed to evolve over the next several months. So the first phase in July 2021 is that legacy tubes and adapters will no longer be manufactured. And the second phase by January 2022 is the transition sets and adapters will no longer be manufactured. So this is something where as healthcare systems, we really have to consider what do we do next? and what is the best way to go about making sure that our patients are safe in all regards in terms of misconnections as well as dosing accuracy. So some big questions that we'll talk about for the duration of the presentation that I want everyone to be thinking about are, do devices that are designed specifically for enteral feedings meet the needs for enteral drug delivery? Are these devices safe and accurate for our smallest neonatal patients? And are there alternative options that provide both ISO compliance as well as dosing accuracy, preferably comparable to our legacy male devices, since that is the type of performance that we've been used to seeing? So neonatal enteral feeding has a lot of caveats to it, and it's in a very um, both high risk and high reward for the neonatal population. Extreme pre prematurity is considered a nutritional emergency. Postnatal growth failure is associated with poor overall neurodevelopmental outcomes. So it really is important that we establish enteral feeds and get babies off of intravenous nutrition as quickly as possible. It is the preferred route for feeding babies. Um, and this is because it helps promote gastrointestinal maturation. It reduces mucosal atrophy and protects against things like necrotizing enterocolitis. The caveat to this is that many times our premature infants have prolonged gavage feedings over many, many weeks to months. And this is due to neurologic immaturity that is needed to coordinate feeding and breathing and swallowing. And so many times you will have babies that have enteral tubing in place that far exceeds the duration of how long they have an intravenous catheter being used. So in my unit with our feeding protocol, most of our even most extremely premature infants, 23, 24 weekers, are off of IV nutrition and are fully on enteral feeds within the first 10 to 14 days of life. And they may stay here for three, four, five months. And so most of that time, they're exclusively receiving enteral feeds as well as enteral medications. There are a lot of things that we need to consider when we're talking about the neonatal population and enteral safety. It is extremely important that we prevent misconnections. They're so fragile and it's so easy to cause harm unintentionally that we do wanna make sure that we are not doing things or using systems that could cause misconnections that could potentially be fatal. We also wanna make sure in general that we have enteral tubing safety and we'll get a little bit more into concerns about that shortly. And then as far as our medication administration, it's highly important that we have accurate dosing, that we have 
um, a threshold of acceptable dosing variance that's clinically appropriate for the patient population as well as for the drug itself. Um, dispense volumes are always a concern. So we know that many times we're dispensing very, very tiny volumes um, and to be able to utilize what's commercially available or to be able to do what's safe for the baby's belly. And then monitoring of side effects is always important because these patients can't tell us what's wrong. So oftentimes we're having to find surrogate markers that in other patient populations, they could just tell us what the problem was and we don't have that in the neonates. So one of the important things about enteral tubing, even with our legacy devices, is that they have risk of contamination. So again, these enteral tubes placed either orally or nasally are often left in places for extended durations. And we do this and we don't routinely change them every day or every other day because the insertion is known to cause measurable distress in preterm infants. And there are studies showing that they have painful stimuli, that these, these are considered painful stimuli and they have um, responses to this similar to other painful stimuli. So we really do try to minimize that since we don't have a way of necessarily controlling the pain with insertion. We also know that these tubes are a source of bacterial exchange between the baby and their surroundings. And we think that these bacteria come mostly from the milk or the formula that's placed into the baby's belly, the colonization of the infant gut itself, as well as environmental um, sources such as caregivers, the mom, the dad, the nurse. So it's important that we make sure that the tube is not creating extra risk um, to these infants. Studies have shown that biofilm containing bacteria can develop in as little as one day after being placed in the neonate. And in this particular study, over half the tubes tested yielded pathogenic bacteria. And the duration of tubes in this particular study of tube placement did not correlate with the presence or density of contamination, meaning that once they got contaminated, they were completely saturated pretty much from the point at which they became contaminated. There are some other studies. This one particularly looked at um, Enterobacter species and they found that 76% of their tubes were contaminated with these organisms from biofilms. And that this occurred regardless of the type of enteral feeding formulation. So it happened whether they were getting mom's milk or whether they were getting sterile um, prepared formulas that shouldn't have had bacteria growing in them. And the concern with this is that with each feed that goes in the stomach every three to four hours, it's bolusing bacteria and setting the baby up for potential harm. So one of the things that I want to point out with the infant enteral tubes, um, with this particular uh, tube from the manufacturer, they say that they can end well for up to 30 days, which is great if we're thinking about minimizing painful stimuli, but maybe not so great if we're potentially having extra risk of contamination, um, such as we see in the picture here, where there can be buildup around the outside of the tube or the outside of the lumen. There are cleaning recommendations for these tubes. So it is recommended that we remove the bacteria and formula debris. And the frequency of this can be dependent on patient factors. So again, in the NICU, we're often accessing those tubes every three to four hours and older patients, it may not be as frequently. And so pretty much we need to be looking every single time to make sure that there's not any potential debris and cleaning that out. So potentially in a neonate, you could be talking about as much as eight times a day. There has been at least one study evaluating cleaning procedures, and I have this listed for you here on the slide. So this, they looked at about 120 patients in each arm, and they chose to do either a diligent cleaning regimen or a less diligent cleaning regimen. And you can see that these contain upwards of 16, 17 steps versus kind of eight to nine steps and contain several supplies. I mean, this particular test, they looked at both the commercial brush that you can purchase um, to do the cleaning with or toothbrushes, toothbrushes. And so this was about equally divided uh, between test and each arm. The interventions is that they coated the tubes with a visible chocolate flavored enteral formula. And then um, and the other half of the tubes, it was an invisible UV light steam formulation called DAZO. So it required use of a UV light to see where the debris still was on the tube after cleaning. 120 nurses were assigned to one of the cleaning regimens, so either the diligent or the less diligent. And then post-cleaning, they were evaluated on a scale of zero to two, zero being no residue, two having significant residue. 
The evaluators were the nurses who scored their own cleaning process, as well as independent blinded investigators who didn't know which arm the tubes were in, but they were provided with photographs of the tube and the DAZO um, on those, those particular tubes. And they were able to evaluate how clean that they thought the tubes were. So in the, the diligent cleaning arm, they found that about 70% still were contaminated. Again, after diligent cleaning, all tests, all conditions. In the less diligent arm, about 87% of the tubes were found to still be contaminated. When we're looking at the chocolate formula, about 46% of the tubes in the diligent arm were still considered contaminated versus 80% in the less diligent arm. And when we're looking at how the nurses evaluated their own cleaning process, they found in the diligent study arm, 16% were still considered dirty versus 25% in the less diligent arm. But when this is compared with how the blinded investigators evaluated the tubes, they deemed about 70% of the tubes were still contaminated in the diligent arm versus 84% in the less diligent arm. So what this really tells us is that the overall effectiveness on the, of the cleaning procedures is fairly poor um, and doesn't do a great job of actually ridding these tubes of contamination. Um, it also shows us that the caregiver perception of their cleaning procedures is markedly higher than unbiased investigators. And that's concerning when we're thinking about the nurses or the people at home having to clean the tubes. If they think it's clean, but it's actually not as clean as I think it is, is that setting patients up for more risk. And while we don't have any studies yet to definitively say that contamination of these tubes causes harm, I think that the clinical implication is that certainly there is potential for harm, especially when we know that our legacy tubes that were not as prone to contamination on the actual outside hub um, can also become contaminated. I think we have to consider does that extra risk of contamination lead to potential for more harm? Just kind of summarize our enteral tubing portion before we move into to drug dosing and accuracy. Um, we know that neonatal enteral tubes sequester potentially harmful bacteria. Uh, we know that colonization and biofilm can happen within 24 hours um, and that some of these tubes are rated to be used upwards as far as 30 days. So there's certainly potential um, for an issue there depending on the situation. We know that medication and milk debris can build up on the infant tubing hub and that the cleaning protocols do not seem to be very effective. And that self-evaluation of these cleaning protocols may overestimate the actual performance. And lastly, more studies are needed to truly evaluate the impact of infant enteral tubing contamination, contamination risk in neonates. So now we'll move on to medication safety in the NICU. We know that neonates are particularly vulnerable to medication errors with an incidence as high as nearly 80 per 100 medication orders. The most common of these are prescribing and, and administration errors followed by dosing. There's not a ton of literature describing device-related errors um, as it pertains to neonatal medication safety, but we do know that liquid formulations seem to be prone to more error. And we know that device-related errors are a potential source um, of harm in the families of pediatric patients, particularly those with low health literacy. So it is concerning if we have a device that may be more difficult to use or require more parts and pieces, that if we are talking about in the home care space with a family that doesn't understand or have great healthcare literacy, there is potential for harm there. One of the things that we don't have a set number for within the neonatal community or even just the pediatric community is what um, the tolerance for dosing variants is. This goes into play with the fact that there are no specific oral device performance standards. So we traditionally think of the, per, the device performance associated with intravenous syringes and we don't have that for our oral and enteral devices. When the infant industry sponsored testing was done on these syringes, they used a plus or minus 10%. And again, there is no standard within the medical community for what that value should be. At least one published paper has said that um, they will go upwards of about 10 to 15% for low risk medications, but that the precision or the um, tolerance goes down um, 
when we have more toxic medications or those that are more likely to cause harm or therapeutic failure. One of the big issues that we have in neonatal medicine is the availability of liquid formulations um, when we are trying to give meds enterally. Commercial preparations are not always available. And so this is often leading us to need to use compounded formulations. And having compounded formulations can be different between facilities and between inpatient and outpatient because there's an overall lack of standardization of what these concentrations and what the formulation should be. Oftentimes the concentrations that we're using in neonatal patients are intended for larger doses or older patients. So many, many times the doses and volumes may be too small to measure. Um, and so oftentimes the answer says, I've heard, well, if it's too small to measure or if we have less accuracy at smaller volumes, we should just increase the volume and that will fix the problem. And that may be true for bigger children and bigger infants, but not necessarily for our smaller neonates. So many, many times the large volumes are not appropriate because they will actually exceed the amount of feeds that these babies get. So I have for you on the right, an example of our feeding protocol here. So if we had a 0.5 kilogram patient, uh, by day three, they're only receiving 1.2 mLs of feeds every three hours. And you can see the first two days when feeds are initiated, they're as low as 0.6 mLs every three hours. So oftentimes we're talking even tiny amounts of milk. So thinking about what's an appropriate medication size needs to be looked at in proportion to what the baby is feeding as well. So I have listed for you here some medications that neonates uh, may be exposed to that um, would be concerns for having high levels of dosing inaccuracy. I just wanted to point out an example patient. So if we have a neonate that we're treating for a neonatal abstinence syndrome with morphine, I have an example here for you where the morphine in this particular study was given every four hours and the median duration of treatment was 20 days. So this is a total of 120 doses. So I want you to just think about 120 doses in a single patient. This is why dosing accuracy and really making sure that the number of doses that we can rely on to be accurate is incredibly important, not just on a global scale, but also on the individual baby scale, because this is just a single example of a single medication in a single baby, and it's 120 doses. So I want you to keep that in mind as we're moving through the rest of the presentation. I think one of the most difficult pieces of talking about enteral device accuracy and, and the safety with dosing is that it's incredibly difficult to dose or to diagnose dosing and accuracy um, in this patient population. So they're nonverbal. Oftentimes their symptoms of toxicity or inadequate dosing may be subtle. Oftentimes they have conflicting clinical data. And so we're making a diagnosis of exclusion. Um, an example, not about enteral, but just about uh, the way that babies often can't tell us what's wrong. I had a patient a few years ago where it was prepared incorrectly. We thought it had a vasopressor in it. It didn't. And we were working through going up on the dose and over and over and over trying to figure out why is the baby acutely hypotensive? What's going on? And it took probably about 30 minutes of tweaking everything else and making sure the lines were in place and the pump was working. The last thing we thought of was is the right amount of drug in the bag. Is there any drug in the bag at all? And so we had sequestered the bag and it turns out it didn't contain what we thought it contained. Um, and so we got there and this was a critically ill infant. So it's a little bit more dramatic than your less critically ill um, intrally feeding baby, but it's, it just highlights that oftentimes the last thing we think about is that there's something wrong with the dose. And so that's really, I want you guys to keep that in mind as we're thinking through well, well, shouldn't it be obvious if our dosing isn't correct? And I would argue that oftentimes in this population, it's not. There are differences in developmental pharmacology that lead to unexpected clinical responses and toxicity in this population. Um, you know, if you have serum concentrations that you can measure for things like our narrow therapeutic index medications, this can be helpful if you suspect that there are too, there's too much or too little drug going in the baby. But this can lead to unnecessary blood draws, uh, painful procedures, which we try to minimize in this population. And many of the medications that we use in neonates don't have an associated laboratory assessment. And so even if we wanted to draw a level, there would be nothing that we could do with that. 
So one of the biggest things that I think we can do to help offset all of these issues or clear communication of the risk and education of our staff who are taking care of these patients to know we're looking for this, we have suspicions that potentially there could be some, some variance in the dosing. And I think that's important to help up the index of suspicion so that people can identify this if it's happening. So INFIT had a multidisciplinary meeting back in July, 2015 at CHOP that had many representatives from important organizations um, within the US. They got clin uh, clinician input and they found that more than 80 medications they were using had liquid doses in volumes less than two mLs. And they, this impacted as many as um, 1200 doses each day, which comes out to nearly half a million doses per year. And so again, thinking about what does the impact mean on a global scale as well as the patient scale and potential for error with half a million doses per year in a single institution. The standard infant syringe at that time was deemed not accurate enough for small volume medication doses. And this is because the dosing variance is as you see on the slide here. So an incredibly wide range, as low as minus 30%, as high as positive 45% too much dose. So it was, not found to be acceptable for the patients that are small and require low volume doses. ISMP issued a dosing accuracy warning in 2015, and it was found that low volume medications were vulnerable to clinically significant under or over dosages. And at the time, several workflow or workaround proposals were given um, rather than addressing the actual design flaw. And I want to draw attention to the pictures on the right so you can see that it's incredibly important to note how the, the tip of the syringe looks after filling the syringe. And so if the syringe, the tip is full after, or after um, dispensing, it needs to be full after administration or you run the risk of an additional 0.2 ml of drug. If it is empty, after dispensing, it needs to be empty after administration or you're losing 0.2 mLs. In 2016, there was an update uh, with the low dose tip feature added to the infit syringe. It was developed to address the industry-wide problem concerning infit syringe dead space and the associated concerns with dosing accuracy of these small volume medications. Um, and while it was a positive step forward in attempting to mitigate the dosing accuracy concerns, it actually added some new areas of concern, um, such as the creation of the moat, which is the space between the male lumen and the outer ring, and the use of oral adapters. So the oral adapters um, were supposed to be used when we were utilizing these syringes orally and not just enterally. So there was a computational fluid dynamics study that looked at the potential dosing implications of the infant design. And this is shown for you on the slides here. You can see that um, the traditional infant syringe is on the top, the low dose tip is on the bottom. And we still had about 0.12 mLs of displaced volume when utilizing the full system of syringe and enteral tube with the infant low dose tip. So now we've added potential adapters um, and these contain, can, can harbor and contain or hold on to drug. Um, we have the moat that was created around the syringe that can also potentially be filled with drug. And so we have to ask ourselves, did this low dose tip feature really correct the issue with the infit syringe? And based off of the fluid computational dynamics and the potential errors, areas that we see for inaccuracy, um, I would say no, and we'll get into some of the clinical data in a minute. So the other syringe that I want to introduce you to is the NutraSafe 2. This was specifically designed for neonates and has been in use since 2005. It is a lockable system that is incompatible with lure and other small bore connectors per 80369-1 standards. Um, it has been designed to minimize the dead space at the tip to reduce dosing and accuracy, and the moat and hub size are small enough to prevent the need for cleaning procedures. The computational fluid dynamics study that was done with the NutraSafe 2 showed a four-fold decrease in potential volume displacement when the syringes were attached to the enteral tubes. And so this is certainly a positive um, step above what we see with the infant lotus tip. Getza published a research poster that showed the ranges of dosing accuracy for the standard and fit 
the male slip tip and the infant lotus tip 1ml syringes. And you can see how wide the spread is, again, with the standard female infant. Um, the male tip syringe leaned more towards minus um, 7.4 and 9.7 as the upper and lower bounds. And the infant lotus tip in this study was a minus three to about 10.5 as the upper and lower limits. Um, some critiques of this, they only tested 1ml syringes and we know the portfolio goes down as low as 0.5. They didn't evaluate any of the adapters. So it's hard to extrapolate what this looks like in clinical practice when you can use them both orally and interally. And they did not provide information regarding the volume of drug tested, which drug was tested, was it water, was it something viscous, and then what method they used for determining dosing accuracy. Uh, some colleagues and I previously did some work and public, published on um, the performance of male legacy versus infant lotus tip syringes. Um, the infant lotus tip, as you can see, on the right, the mean dosing variance plus or minus was 8.1% versus a mean dosing variance of 3.9% in the male syringes. But I just want to highlight, if you look how wide the spread is with the low-dose tip, even though the actual dosing variance seems to be appropriate, the amount that fall outside of that range, and for those that do fall outside of the plus or minus 10%, the variance is great. Um, we also looked at the percentage of tested syringes that fell outside of a dosing variance of plus or minus 10% and found that nearly 30% of the low-dose tip syringes tested um, would not have had acceptable dosing variance. The low-dose tip with adapters were fairly uh, subject to underdosing, as you can see in the graph to your right. And we did find that smaller syringes, so the 0.5 mLs especially, were vulnerable to high dosing variants. And this was true with um, some of the larger syringes at lower doses of their dosing capacity as well. So we recently competed, completed an in vitro study of the NS2 for dosing accuracy, similarly to what we did with the male slip tip previously. And we tested 150 syringes per arm um, total and 50 within each of the sizes. So we did 0.51 and then the, the Nutrisafe 2 comes in a 2.5 ml versus a 3 ml uh, with the low dose tip. We filed the FDA improved instructions for use for each syringe. Um, we tested we tested children's Dimatap and we looked at it with bulk bottles with their associated adapters and medication cups. The dosing accuracy was assessed by dosing variance and then our primary assessment was a greater than 10%, the number of tests with greater than 10% variance. Uh, we did calculate a sample size and needed 104 tests in each arm to detect at least a 15% absolute reduction in primary, the primary outcome. So the overall results that we found are here listed for you on the slide. So with the Infit syringe, um, the low dose tip overall combining all 150 tests, about 48% of the tests were outside of the accepted dosing range of 10% versus about 5% of the NS2 syringes. Um, this was fairly comparable to what we found with our male legacy syringes in our previous study. If you look at the overall dosing variances, without the use of the oral adapters, um, the infant low dose tip mean dosing variance is plus or minus almost 12% versus 3.3% with the NS2. Um, and I just want to highlight again that mean dosing variance of 3.3 is incredibly comparable to the 3.9% that we previously found with the male syringes. So this performance um, does feel a little bit more like the male syringe to the um, people who are used to using those. And we did find the infant lotus tip was more likely to result in higher than intended doses in the absence of using the oral adapters. Looking at it by syringe size, so 0 0.5, 1, and the 2.5 and 3 ml syringes, um, we found better performance with the NS2 as well. So the 0 0.5 ml syringe, um, the overall dosing variance was about 4.6%. The 1 ml was 2.8 and the 2.5 was 3.3 as compared to the infant low dose tip where we saw a much higher dosing variance with our 0.5 ml syringes of 16 versus about 10.7 and then 8.8 .8 with the 3 ml syringes. And then lastly, looking at it compared to 
bulk bottle dispensing versus medication cup dispensing. The NS2 is consistent between the two forms, um, whereas the NFIT had a range of about 13.3% in the bulk bottle with adapter versus about 9.7% overall dosing variance with the medication cup. So for the data summary for this, um, it looks like the NS2 syringes appear to have comparable dosing accuracy to our previously studied male slip tip syringes. Uh, the infant low dose tip has a greater dosing and accuracy when compared to both the male slip tip and the female NutriSafe 2 syringes. And it looks like the infant syringes without adapters um, in this study that we did were more vulnerable to higher than intended doses where in the previous study when we used the oral adapters, they were more prone to lower than intended doses. So this is important when um, we're looking at how we're using these medications or these devices and whether we should be concerned for toxicity versus therapeutic failures. So to bring it back to our example of our baby being treated for neonatal abstinence, um, out of those 120 doses, if 48% of those exceed a dosing variance of plus or minus 10%, that's 58 doses for one baby for one disease state that are outside of an acceptable dosing range. And if we go back to our example of the nearly half a million doses from CHOP that they put out per year that are these low volume doses, that's over 200,000 doses per year that exceed a dosing variance of 10%. And so again, that's only one hospital in one place and that's only one baby with 120 doses, but the impact and the numbers and the breadth of how much this can affect patients cannot be um, stated enough. So what can we as healthcare providers do to protect our patients from misconnections and dosing and accuracy? And how do we interpret the statements and standards from the safety and regulatory boards? So I'm sure we've all seen the FDA letter to healthcare providers that was put out in 2018. I've copied and pasted these for you here. So for the healthcare provider, they're stressing to make sure that you check with your distributor and manufacturer to determine whether your connectors meet the standards. And then for the purchasing departments, they explicitly say to purchase internal devices that comply with either 80369-1 or 80369-3 series to reduce the risk of misconnections. In the US, the ISMP Best Practices 2021 document, Best Practice 4, tells us um, that we should be using either oral or 80369 compliant syringe tips since these are incompatible with vascular lines. And they want us to ensure that all oral medications that are not available in unit dis packaging are dispensed by the pharmacy in an oral or an enteral syringe that meets 80369 criteria. So where does the infant low dose tip fit into the ISO standards? So some decisions were made in 2018 by the 20695 group, which again, the 20695 encompasses 80369-1 and 3. And what they found is that the low dose tip syringe does not reliably increase dosing accuracy over the standard infant syringe. And again, we know that the standard infant syringe is prone to dosing inaccuracy from the information that been put out by Getza. The low-dose tip was thus removed from the normative requirements of this standard and is included in the informational section only so that manufacturers have the dimensions for how to produce the syringe, but that the syringe does not meet the standards because of the issue with unreliable dosing accuracy. Bygone has been highly involved in both of these ISO committees. So they've been a member with the 80369 working group They've been involved since 1997, bringing expertise and recommendations to create safe enteral connector standards for all patients. They were instrumental in identifying neonates as a high risk population. And so a specific rationale was added into 80369 via the Annex A. They've also been highly involved in the 20695 working group since the beginning in 2014. And again, they were there lobbying for neonatal medication safety and accuracy about the low dose tip and the potential for dosing and accuracy. And again, that was the latest meeting in 2018 removed from the normative requirements. Just to, to sum up our clinical and operational considerations, so we have our infant lotus tip versus our NS2. The mean overall dosing variance 
when compiling all syringes together for the low dose tip was around 8.1 to 11.9%, whereas the NS2 was 3.3%. And again, our male performance was 3.9%. So you're, you're comparable between those two. I do want to note that the low dose tip, um, that mean overall dosing variance starts to fall apart a bit when we look at different syringe sizes and the types of adapters used in the intended dosing volume, where that number goes up significantly with smaller syringes and lower dosing volumes. We have doses with variance greater than 10%, upwards of 48% in the low dose tip group versus 4.7% with the NS2. The enteral tube cleaning requirements that exist with the low dose tip do not exist with the NS2 and its tubing. And then oral adapters are recommended for use with low dose tip, but are not a part of the NS2 profile. So for some key takeaway points, the male slip tip and compatible tubing availability is being phased out by the enteral device suppliers in the US over the next kind of nine to 12 months. Um, Infit does not address the specific needs of neonatal patients. And this is acknowledged within the 20695 standard with the failure of the Lotus tip to reliably deliver accurate doses. We also know that the proposed two cleaning protocols appear to yield low results. And again, while we cannot definitively say what that risk looks like right now, we cannot rule out that there is risk from that. The NS2 is designed specifically for neonatal patients, and in our latest analysis showed superior dosing accuracy compared to the low dose tip and does not have a cleaning protocol required. So some things for us to think about uh, as we're advocating for our neonatal patients, we know that our neonates need a safe and accurate option for dosing accuracy with enteral devices. We know that early detectability of harm in neonates is probably limited, but just because we don't know in the moment that there is risk, it doesn't mean that we're not causing long-term harm. And we can't ignore the fact that even if something seems subtle, a day of life two in a baby or four in a baby or 14 in a baby doesn't mean that it doesn't have a long-term negative impact, um, such as our infants that may be taking HIV meds to prophylax from getting it from their mom. And if we aren't dosing accurately, could cause toxicity or an HIV infection. So there's serious implications that we won't necessarily see in the moment that can cause long-term poor outcomes. The NS2 can be used in conjunction with infant and healthcare systems to achieve ISO standard compliance. So if you have a healthcare system that's already using infant um, but needs a safer option for their neonatal population, this can be done with infant at place um, for older populations. Or if you have a healthcare system that's considering converting that wants to try to find the safest dosing option for their babies, they can move with forward with the NS2 as an option for their most fragile, vulnerable neonates. And then again, there's always an opportunity for standardization and improvement in our enteral and oral formulations that are used in this population. Um, we do know that oftentimes there's less accuracy with the smaller volumes and with those smaller syringes. Um, so can we find a way to, to make a happy medium between a dose that's too small and a dose that's too large? And that concludes the presentation.